Welcome, welcome to this seminar that today is in this mixed form. We have people here in the room, not so many, but okay. <laughs> and we have people connected from online, from home or the office. So today is my pleasure to introduce Albert Bedaguer. I don't know where to put me in this way. <laughs> yeah, vale. Today is my pleasure to introduce Albert Bedaguer. He has been in the CMAP since three years, I think. And his research focuses on the interaction of water on different surfaces, from minerals to nanostructures and, pattern, and chemically patterned surfaces. But today, he, he's going to talk about something very different and related with the COVID pandemic that we, that we have this year. So he's going to talk about CO2 meters to control COVID transmissions indoors. So without more talking, I will let him the floor. He will tell us how he ended up working in this project. So Albert, you can start. Thank you, Esther, for your nice introduction. <laughs> I was saying that, uh, as uh, Esther mentioned it, how uh, I ended up doing this kind of, of things. Uh, my main research is about uh, water and surfaces. And one of the, uh, I would say, most successful uh, lines that we have been performing during the last 20 years it was a study of uh, small solid particles that float in air, that's called aerosols. And the interaction of these particles with water, the water we have in the humidity. Uh, these particles can be minerals, dust from the deserts, can be pollen, uh, can be uh, small salt crystals coming from the sea. And these studies have important implications in climatological things like, for example, depletion of the ozone layer or uh, how this, uh, particles trigger ice nucleation of these small droplets in clouds inducing or triggering uh, rain and snow. So one year ago, uh, I was locked down at home like most of us, and I started reading papers uh, related to my own uh, research field, which basically was water surfaces or aerosols and uh, COVID, okay? So I'm gonna show you some of the papers that, uh, let me see if this uh, works. It's not moving. No. It's not working. I can do it with the keyboard. Or? Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. So now it's going to work or not? Okay. So here I'm showing some of the papers I was reading. First, this paper, this paper, as I'll tell you uh, later, this is one important paper, how the surface stability of uh, virus of, of COVID on surfaces, also related to humidity conditions, for example, it's the part that was, I was more interested. There was also this part. So as you can see at that time, Many people publish papers and then they have to modify them or retract on them because things were very fast. So this paper was very interesting for me at the beginning. The title of this paper was High Temperature and High Humidity Reduce Transmission of COVID. Well, I was really impressed because, okay, I said, okay, maybe we can do something with humidity, which is the thing I understand. Then they change it to impact of temperature and relative humidity on the transmission, a modeling study, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so things really change it with time. And these two papers, maybe other papers, could this make me the decision to try to do something while I was locked down, no? They called for uh, environmental uh, scientists. I don't know if I am an environmental scientist, but at least I know something to try to uh, understand the role of environmental factors in the transmission of coronavirus. So we start a project, a simulation project with different partners to try to uh, study the impact of humidity on the transmission of uh, COVID. Unfortunately, we didn't get money for that. Okay, nothing happens. But I get in contact with many other people and by the 
beginning of October, I entered in contact with uh, the next the group I'm going to show you. This group is called, we call it Aireamos. This is a Spanish group. It was at the beginning a Spanish group, now it's an international group, uh, which basically, as you, if you know Spanish or not, uh, in what says is we ventilate, okay? This group, as you can see here in the different uh, logos, there are people from different institutes involved, even people from different uh, physics institutes, universities, uh, people uh, from more technical views, so te technicians from air quality control, even people from uh, companies. And we, they were all together joining to try to gather all the information about transmission of virus through the air. Okay, I will explain you what, what the meaning of that. So, so transmission of COVID uh, by uh, aerosols. Okay, and we were more or less, let's say, lead by Jose Luis uh, Jimenez, which is a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Okay, we have a web page we can you can visit it's aireamos.org in which we put all the things that uh, we gathered through for this last nine months. So uh, I get in contact with this group and we start to do something. Everything, everybody here was volunteering for doing that. At that time, nobody has any financial support for that. Right now, different people from different institutes got financial support for continuing part of the research that started with this original uh, idea. So before continuing, I don't know, it can seem a little bit silly, but Okay, because this is a very sensitive thing. Uh, the first thing I want to see, uh, I want to say is a, a disclaimer of responsibility. So the first thing I want to you understand is that we can be totally wrong. Okay, why is that? We are scientists from the chemist and physicist point of view. We are not doctors. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is general, general view of ongoing tests, researchers, there are no final conclusions. These are based on evidence on the fact that we know today, maybe tomorrow we have to change our mind. And of course, in any case, we are not saying that what we suggest can't overrule recommendations from the government. I want this to be clear. Anyway, I have to say that many governments are nowadays following similar uh, recommendations for COVID transmission as the ones we started nine months ago, not only our group, of course, there are many different groups uh, in the world that are following the same line. And as I'll show you later, for us is a big success that the Center for Disease Control from the United States last week already put in their webpage the recommendations that we were pushing up nine months ago, okay? So right now I have to say that most of these recommendations are more or less agree for at least most of the Western uh, governments. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning. So how can someone be infected by, by COVID? Uh, we all understand that the COVID, the virus doesn't travel alone and it travels because the virus is in our lungs, basically, and we expel it to the, to the exterior by breathing, by coughing, by uh, uh, through small droplets, okay, of saliva that contain virus inside, okay? So we spell it, somebody else in inhale this virus and get contaminated, right? Anyway, this is a very general rule of how this uh, COVID transmits, but we can divide it in three main transmission routes. Okay, so here I'm showing three main possible transmission paths. One is direct contact with large aerosols. I will explain now. Second is fomites, so surfaces that are contaminated. And the third one, the most important one right now, is breathing air that contain aerosols of uh, COVID. Okay, so in this uh, cartoon here, we're trying to uh, summarize all these transmission uh, ways. So you have this uh, blue and red droplets, or that large droplets, that basically they fall down on the floor 
quite rapidly, okay? Because they are really, they are too high to keep floating in there and they drop actually on the floor. Here you have, for example, an estimation on how long will be a droplet floating in air, depending on the size of the droplet emitted by someone, this is for a standard room conditions, emitted by someone like, I don't know, one and a half meter height, okay? So as you can see, the small one can be up to 40 hours floating while this large one in a few seconds, they already fell down on the, on the floor, okay? So if you are close to someone, of course, you can get, uh, you can cut coat, uh, the COVID because of this large droplet. But if you are far away from someone, this uh, line of contagion, it's really uh, canceled, okay? Then another thing that can happen is that these droplets fell down on a surface. This surface get contaminated, this is called fomite. And then you touch the surface and somehow maybe with your hand, you touch your mucus system and you get also contaminated, okay? And finally, what is more interesting nowadays is these small uh, droplets that can stay for a really long time floating in air. And then when you inhale them, when you breathe them, you get contaminated. This is very interesting, very important because that means that in a, if in a room, somebody with COVID enters the room, stays in the room for a while, then leaves the room, you can enter a room that it's empty and you can still get COVID because there are still some of these aerosols floating in air. This is called, what is called airborne transmission. So how we avoid these three routes of uh, transmission? Well, the first one is the, easy, the easiest one and actually we have been done from the very beginning, okay? To avoid large droplets that really stay short time in the air, the best way is to, of course, wear a mask that protects you from these droplets to contact directly your mucus system and to keep social distance. With that, you almost should avoid uh, most of uh, this transmission path, okay? And this is what we have been done from the very beginning of the pandemic. So the, we really cut this transmission path really fast. And we consider that nowadays, if everybody feel, uh, follows all these uh, mask and social distance protocols, this transmission should be almost uh, null, okay? The second one is transmission through surfaces. Uh, I mentioned that at the, uh, it was maybe it was February, January, 2020, this uh, paper came out in which they measured how long virus that were deposited on a surface survive in time. Okay, what they found is, for example, that that depends on the tip kind of surfaces. And for example, for plastic, they found that they can survive uh, in the order of uh, more than uh, 48 hours or around 48 hours. That was a very impact at that moment because people said, okay, then we can have transmission of virus through surfaces that have been contaminated and they have active virus for more than 24 hours in that surface. And as you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, we were cleaning any surfaces, plastics, uh, I don't know, whatever we, we, we bought on the supermarket. Uh, well, that, that was okay, okay? This, I'm not saying this paper is wrong, this paper is okay. The, the, there has been more studies later on. Uh, the only thing is that that was a study performed in a lab conditions with a, uh, with a given conditions. So it was a limited study, but because at that time we didn't have anything else, even the, uh, the, the OMS take this as a rule and the recommendation of cleaning everything, okay? We now know that uh, this uh, path of transmission is very slow. And uh, I would say that uh, between the different uh, experimental uh, papers that are now published, that the transmission, this transmission rate is considered to be between zero and 10%, okay? Of the possible transmission path. And actually last uh, February, it was this paper in nature said, okay, 
if COVID really infects through surfaces, so why we are still deep cleaning? Okay, this is a Nature paper, I think February, yeah, February 2021. So it seems that, uh, okay, we have to wash our hands for sure, because it's our main uh, path for this kind of transmission, but it's not needed, it seems that it's not needed to really clean everything as we did at the very beginning, uh, as we actually we don't do right now, okay? If you want to see, you can check this paper and you will see all the evidence, all the reference of all the papers who support uh, this, uh, this highlight here, okay? So it seems that we cut the first uh, path of transmission through masks and social distance. This second path is really low. It cannot explain how the transmission of COVID has maintained a high rate, even if we were wearing masks and social distance. So we end up having only one possible way to explain it is through aerosols that uh, keep in air for a long time, okay? So how we can imagine like the smoke. So now smoking is forbidden in many places, but I'm sure both, most of you remember when it was not. And as you remember, when somebody was smoking in a room, the smoke uh, stays on the room for a long time. So we can image that actually COVID stays as a smoke in a room long time after even the people left the room. Okay, unless we ventilate, okay, unless we change the air in uh, indoors, uh, indoor places, okay. Unfortunately, a smoke can be seen, and uh, these are small saliva droplets that contain uh, viruses cannot be seen, okay. So the question is how we control it? Well, we control it as we always did with the smoke through ventilation, and this is the main point of our group Aireamos. So we know that to control this transmission path, what we have to do is ventilation. And the question is, well, how we control if ventilation is good enough? Because we cannot measure directly the amount of COVID that we have in a room. We want an easy way, cheap way, and re reliable way to uh, check if our ventilation is good enough to assure a low uh, transmission through aerosols in the room, okay? I said in a room because as you can image even from the smoke, if you are outdoors, uh, dispersion of the aerosols is really fast. So we can consider that we are very uh, quite safe outdoors if we are wearing masks, keeping social distance, unless you are in a very crowded place, I don't know, like a rock concert with many people and in a day that there is no wind, well, then maybe you can have something like an indoor situation, but outdoors, more or less, we, uh, we consider that we are safe. And there are several papers that conclude that approximately the probability of getting uh, COVID outdoors is 20 times lower than indoors, okay? So, as I mentioned at the beginning, it was uh, last week that the Center for Disease Control and I'm gonna follow what they say because it's in line of what we have been uh, working and because here it's really well written. Okay, they know how to write it. Uh, so I'm gonna follow the recommendation which is like actually the same recommendation that we have been uh, performing for the last month. So uh, what the Center for Disease Control of the United States said in the, their webpage update last week is that uh, the multiple ways to mitigate uh, transmission of COVID includes uh, ventilation, okay? Apart from, of course, physical distancing, wearing face masks, hand hygiene, and vaccination, of course, okay? And uh, this is the idea. So as you will see that many of the, the cartoons and the pictures that we are showing are related to the to class rooms especially for the school, because uh, during all these months, the only place when we can really make some tests are were in the classrooms, because the students were, uh, were maybe the only ones allowed to be many people together in a single space, okay? So we were adjusting everything or most of the things for uh, 
uh, skull rooms. Okay, so here is what we call the best way to do that. Okay, so ventilation, uh, usually, uh, let's say what we call uh, natural ventilation, so ventilation coming from windows, and what we call it cross ventilation, so ventilation that air enters from one part and uh, leave the room from another point so that you have a, what this is called cross ventilation so you have full ventilation of the entire room okay so following following the recommendation of cdc as i said they said that the concentration of viral particles is often higher in indoors than outdoors okay uh ventilation reduce viral particle concentration and the lower concentration, the less like, of course, to be uh, infected. Okay, so basically, this cartoon uh, were made for kids. Of course, the basic rules are wearing mask, keep your distance, better outside, and ventilation. So let's go back to the question of how we know if we are really well ventilated. Okay, one of the uh, of the uh, measurements of the, the let's say the, the things that uh, tell us how how good we are ventilated or how is a thing ventilated is called the air change per hour. So basically, uh, one air change per hour means that in one hour there is a volume equal to the volume of the room that enters into the room, because the air is mixing. Actually, one ACH doesn't mean that you change all the air inside the room, but it changed probably uh, around 60% per, 60 of the air. For two hours, you have 80% of change, and then for three hours, 95%. Well, according to the Harvard uh, School Public Health recommendations, uh, what they recommend is to have an ACH of five to six to have an excellent ventilation, and lower than three is considered not enough, okay? Anyway, how you get your ACH from your room? I mean, there is a thing that cannot be uh, obtained really easy. Well, one way to do that, and it's already uh, recommended by the CDC, is that measuring carbon dioxide, okay? So when we are breathing, as I mentioned, we ex exhale these droplets containing virus, but we also exhale CO2 in standard conditions in a room where there is no fire, no kitchen, the, the main sources of uh, CO2 are actually breathing of people. So we can directly relate concentration of CO2 and ventilation of a room. Actually, there are many, many different uh, kind of uh, small uh, meters that you can buy in the market that actually tells you the amount of uh, CO2 that you got on the room. They can also give you, for example, temperature and humidity. And you can also have this light telling you if you are in a good position or not. So you have a good or bad ventilation. Anyway, this, this uh, traffic light here, uh, is, you can set, set it up as you wish. So you, you can only trust it if you know what's, what's put inside the, 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 the meter. Uh, I brought here a meter. As well, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to put it here. So right now in the room, we are exactly at 700. I have to tell you that this is not fake. This is real, OK? Because as you will see, 700 is actually what we recommend. So what's the CO2 level that is recommended? OK, this is not new. This has been already used to control uh, the amount of CO2 that you have in a room because it's considered that above 1,000 ppm parts per million, uh, it has implication on concentration, okay? Concentration of uh, people who's studying, uh, uh, whatever, they have a lack of concentration. So they, they were already some limits recommended by the OMS or the RITE. This is the Spanish uh, consideration for ventilation of building between 1,900 ppm, but not related to COVID. So this was already here before the COVID, okay? Right now, our limits to avoid uh, or to lower uh, uh, possible of transmission of COVID, it's around 800 for the CDC limit. And our limit was a little bit lower, was 700. 
well, these this limits uh, are based on models on how much air you are breathing every time you breathe that has been already breathed by somebody else. Okay, for example, at 800 ppm, 1% of the breath of the air you are breathing every time has been already uh, before breathed by another, another person, okay? And one important thing is that these limits uh, depends slightly on the baseline of CO2. There is a baseline of CO2 that we have in our atmosphere. It's around 420 ppm. This baseline is quite stable, but can depend a little bit on the place where you live. If you live in a, in a very uh, crowded city with a lot of cars, well, this can be a little bit uh, higher. So instead of uh, using that, many people prefer to use the difference between the, what you are measuring in the, in, in the indoors and the exterior baseline. So how you measure the exterior baseline, just put one of these things outside or just, for example, for classroom, you wait until at night and when nobody's on the room, the room has already ventilated a lot and you can measure this, this baseline, okay? So what's the problem, as you can guess, and the CDC already points out? Actually, we have limited information of direct link associated between CO2 concentration and risk of COVID transmission. Okay, we have to understand that all what we are seeing here is based on models and physical and chemistry uh, uh, experiments, but they are not, as far as I know, they are not, um, let's say medical experiments that can provide a direct link saying, okay, if I have a higher ventilation, I will have a lower, uh, transmission of COVID. It seems that this is very intuitive, but for the medical, for the doctors, this is not enough. What they need are real evidence on that. So we don't have this evidence yet. We have it for other uh, illness that transmit through air, like tuberculosis, for example, but not for the COVID yet, okay? So, and the problem is that even if we are measuring CO2, we cannot predict who has COVID, okay? So we don't know if they, we have one person, two person, three persons with COVID inside the room, okay? Or the amount of airborne viral particles produced by these people. So we need some models to adjust this at its best way that we can use it for, uh, to make spaces safe. And this is the kind of thing that we have been trying to do for the past month. So here I'm showing some measurements that have been performed on different indoor spaces. And not, as you, you will see, I'm just putting here general uh, labels. These are real, this is a real museum, this is a real classroom, this is a real laboratory. I cannot put what museum is it because of course uh, they want to be uh, protected, okay? So, but as, as you could see, this is a measurement from several days, okay, in a museum. A classroom, a laboratory, and here I cannot see what was that. I think it was a, a, a theater, yeah, cinema. Well, as you can see, uh, green, it was 700, and the, the green is until 700. Yellow is between 700 and 800, red is more than 800. As you can see in the museum, unfortunately, not a lot of people go to museums, so we have a very low level of CO2. Classroom, we have some peaks that we can consider dangerous for COVID transmission but we have a really low baseline. Laboratories in that case was all the time lower than 700 and the same for the theater, okay? All these uh, measurements were performed by one of the members of uh, IAMS, which is Mesura, that is based in Valencia. So let's see, uh, this is a, well, as you can see, we can measure for several days and we can test how a room behaves and we have uh, measured the occupancy of the room and what happens uh, in the room all the time, we can get some information on uh, how, how would all the different rooms are ventilated. So let's see uh, an example. This is a school classroom. Okay, we have a school. Uh, it starts, as you can see, it starts already at 700. So probably there was something here. So it was not empty the room, okay? We have 100% of occupancy of the room. So all the students were in the room. 
everything was closed. As you can see, the CO2 level starts to rise, rise, rise up, up, up to even uh, 2,600. And then uh, students left the room, they opened windows and doors, and we have the decay of the CO2 through ventilation, okay? This is what the people was doing this winter, okay? So uh, let's see what happens with different kinds of ventilation of, uh, I, I think it's the same room, but I'm not totally sure, but okay. So we have at the beginning, no ventilation, okay? So it's going up, like in this case here. And then they open the door, we have some ventilation, and then that happens a lot of times, it reaches what we call a steady state in which the amount of CO2 that are emitting and the amount of CO2 that is uh, going through the door reaches a level, a steady state level in which we have a more or less a plateau in the amount of uh, CO2 that we have in the room. So we have a stable behavior. Then they close again, I don't know why they do that. They close again and it goes up. And then with the people inside, they open the doors and the windows and we can see how it goes down. So ventilation works and with the CO2, we can test the ventilation that we have in the room. Let's see a couple of more examples. So the same room, we have 100 occupancy. All the students are inside. Everything is closed. It goes up. Then some people left, some students left the room, and then it reaches a steady state with lower occupancy. So it stays stable here. Even if nothing is open, it seems that there was a minimum ventilation is always present in the rooms. And then they open windows and door, they left the room and it goes down. And finally, here we have a different case. At the beginning, we have no ventilation. Then they open the door. We have a steady, a steady state. They open everything. It goes down. And that important thing, because we don't emit the same kind of CO2 all the time, depending on what we are doing. We are sitting, we are talking, we are moving around. So what happened here, it was some kind of dynamic play, high activity, what we call high activity in the room. And even with ventilation, as you can see, uh, the level of CO2 goes up a little bit. So this is a thing that has to be considered also when checking the ventilation of the room, the kind of activity that we are performing inside the room. And finally, it goes down when everything uh, is open again. Okay, so what they did is taking uh, into account this, uh, this room, they measured the recovery times of CO2 for different setups of the same room. Everything closed, only the door open, door and the windows in front of the door open. As you can see here, we have a limited uh, amount of uh, ventilation and what we call the cross ventilation in which we open the opposite uh, part of the, of the door. So on the opposite side, just to have a higher ventilation. And these are the times. I don't like very much this, this uh, graph because actually, as you saw before, the decay of the CO2 is not linear. It's actually, it's a logarithmic decay. So here, basically what they measured was the original point and the final point, but they got, give us an idea on how long it takes for a room to ventilate depending on the situation. So as you can see, after one hour in the close, uh, setup, you still have almost the same level of CO2. And in the yellow one, when everything is well ventilated, at 10, 20 minutes, you are in the almost base level of, the, of what you have, the normal CO2 that you have, okay? Okay, uh, this is one of the measurements uh, I'm working on. This is in collaboration with, uh, with Andorra. And here we have a classroom. Okay, so at the beginning, it's a really a low level of CO2. So this is the level you expect from standard uh, atmospheric level. It goes up because the students start to arrive. You have some oscillations here that we don't really know what happens here. The, the thing here is here, we don't know what kind of ventilation we have in the room. But what we have is that at some point, all the students left the room and the level of CO2 goes down. Then they, op they go again to the room, as you can see, in 30 minutes of ventilation, it was not enough to reach the low level. So the first thing here we learn is that with the ventilation that of this room, they need more than 30 minutes to really get rid of all the CO2, okay? Then they have 50% occupancy, the different, different uh, lecture. 
and then you have a decay again. Okay, we can calculate using this equation, very easy equation, the uh, change per hour of the room through the decay that we measure with the CO2. Here we have a air change per hour of three. This is quite similar. I think actually they have both the same ventilation, so they didn't change uh, doors or windows or whatever. And the difference here are probably due to mistake in the, in the measures or the calculation. So as you can see, if we compare with what Harvard University said, well, we are really far from what's optimal, okay? So here we learned that in this school, uh, they need more than 30 minutes to ventilate the room and that actually the level of ventilation is not good enough. Okay, so a uh, few weeks ago, uh, many people involved in that and led by uh, uh, Jose Luis Jimenez, they uh, showed uh, a model which allow us to calculate through the level of ventilation, the activity level, the occupancy, the decay rate of COVID, the room volume, if people are wearing masks or not masks, the time, whatever. All the parameters you can imagine, you can put inside this model and they give you an idea of the risk that you have in this room, okay? They, they show two different parameters. They call H, the infection risk parameter, and HR, relative infection risk parameter. And by comparing with known outbreaks of COVID, they set up the levels and which they consider to have a low and medium and high risk. Using this model, you can find it here. Uh, we apply it to the previous study. And well, you can apply this model. And for example, in the, in the paper, they are showing with this uh, green, yellow, and red, how uh, well uh, ventilated are different uh, conditions. For example, uh, outdoor, indoor with well ventilation, poor ventilation with low occupancy, high occupancy, and with different uh, possible activities, okay, inside the, inside the room. So if we apply in the, to the previous uh, study, what uh, we have, the first thing that we have is by using this model, we can predict the CO2 that we will have according to the activity level. Here I'm showing high activity level, we call it high, it's sitting, walking, doing office work, not, not doing workout, actually not exercising. Uh, what we expect for what we know in the room, what we, that the students were sitting and doing office work, or we have also the low level if the students are just sitting and listening to the teacher. Well, as you can see, what we measure was really close to what's expected from, a, let's say, a medium activity level, okay? And by applying that, we calculate our uh, infection risk parameter for this room in, and this event that was a two hours class with 100% occupancy. We have our, uh, our risk and even we can calculate the probability of infection by an individual that is inside this room, assuming one person infected in the room. Okay, so here they have the probability of the model. And as you can see in this room, we are all the time in the uh, orange and red levels. And we can, the model allows us to also calculate with mask and no mask. So if people is wearing mask or people non wearing mask, okay? So let's go to a different place. Uh, let's bring it back again, right here. As I said here, among all the parameters you have to include in the model and that have been considered to calculate the uh, risk parameters, this, this is important. This is the decay rate of uh, COVID aerosols, okay? That depends, that depends on humidity and temperature. So this small droplet that we have on a room, as we show at the beginning, they have a decay rate. They, at the end, they fall down on the floor. That depends on many things, on humidity, temperature, and also on uh, sunlight, not because the sunlight destroys the droplet, but because the sunlight, UV, destroy the virus itself, okay? So the, you can, if you go uh, to the Department of Homeland Security of the USA, they have a calculator in which you can introduce your UV index, temperature and relative humidity, and based on different models and experiments, it tells you uh, the time that you need for the virus decay, depending on your conditions, okay? And these are the three main conditions, UV as mentioned, temperature and humidity. 
you can apply that and see how important are these uh, parameters. So the first thing is UV light. Okay, if we measure the time required for the decay of 90% of the virus aerosol in a standard condition, 21 degrees Celsius, 40% of relative humidity, depending uh, if you are midday in summer, for example, midday in winter or indoors, as you can see, the time of the gate is really, really different. Summer, it decays really fast, nine minutes, while indoors, it can take more than four hours for this to decay. So thinking back on this time, much better to ventilate than expect the virus to decay, of course. Let's see what happens with the temperature. The temperature has a low effect in the range of the temperatures in which we live, okay? If we compare, for example, at 22 degrees Celsius or 26 degrees Celsius, which are temperatures that you can find indoors, but not very far from that. You see that at 22 degrees Celsius, you have a decay in three hours, while at 26, you have a decay in two hours. So it's not, at least for this range of temperatures, it's not a very important parameter. And what it's do, it's really important. What has more importance is relative humidity, especially if you go at low humidity, you can see that the decay goes up to 16 hours while at standard humidity, it's around two hours. So there are many guides that recommend range of humidity between 40 and 60%. Anyway, in the CDS, CDC recommendations, they still said that the, the, the implication of relative humidity is not clear, okay? But if we apply that to the previous study and compare the difference with, of, uh, of uh, infection risk depending on the humidity, actually that was measured in a very low humidity at 20%. Uh, as you can see, it goes, it's, it, it's quite important. If you check, for example, the probability of being infected at 20% humidity or 60% humidity, it has an important uh, impact. This is the part which I'm more involved at in trying to distribute how the humidity affects and uh, why this, uh, this happens. So uh, just to finish, I summarize here. Uh, now we have this IAMOS international group. So at the beginning it was an Spanish group. Now we are international people from many parts of the world. And actually this is what we said in our meetings, okay? And this is the points that we all agree with because we don't agree in everything, okay? So we said that right now the major fraction of transmission of SARS is airborne that transmission is more likely to happen indoors, okay? Ventilation indoors is key to reduce COVID transmission. And uh, CO2 measurement is the best available low cost for ventilation. And I didn't uh, talk about filtration of air or any ways to uh, purification of the air. This is a very complex thing, uh, but you can go to our webpage and find uh, different recommendations on that. And finally, of course, that mask should be worn all the time in indoor environments. So if you find it interesting, go to our webpage. Unfortunately, right now it's only in Spanish. There are many material here, uh, recommendations, uh, uh, diptychs, anything that, 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 that can help you on that. Uh, I think we are already, uh, we have an international folder already in which many of the information has been already uh, translated into English. So uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer any, any question that I can answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert. Now we will open the time for questions. For those who are connected online, you have two ways for asking questions. You can ask using the chat, and then the question will be read. Or you can raise the hand, I mean, the electronic hand that you have in the program. And then we will give you permit to directly interact with Albert, which is probably better. Okay. 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 Next, uh, Frances, you can ask. What? What? Are you? Okay, you have to open the micro. Okay. Maybe can you, you hear me now? Yes. Now, perfect. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Albert, for the very nice talk, and I I learned a lot of things. I, I, I wanted to ask that uh, one day I, I, I took one of these CO2 met meters and mm -hmm. I went to the lab. I realized that the, that the measurement depends on the height. 
I mean, it's not the same if you measure close to the floor, that in the ceiling. And, and then I, I wonder if there is a recommendation of where to, where to make the measurements and how this uh, will affect the relation with the, with the concentration of aerosols. I mean, does the, let's say, height distribution of aerosols the same than the height distribution of CO2 in the room? And I guess that this will have some implication for large, uh, large places like, I don't know, like uh, uh, big theaters or, or stadiums or indoor stadiums, I mean, mm -hmm. or things like this. Yeah, th that's a very good question. Actually, there is some people trying to do that. Uh, we, it's, it's still not finished. I know people that have been like a three-dimensional measuring of a room, putting several uh, instrumentation is not finished. You are right. We have distribution of CO2 that depends on the, especially if you have bad ventilation, that depends on the, on the height. What we recommend is to put uh, uh, your CO2 lab measurement at the level of people is breathing because it's, this is the important one, okay? And far from direct, uh, not very close to people. I mean, not not next to someone which is breathing on on the on the on the meter. As you mentioned as well, uh, distribution of CO two is not the same as distribution of uh, these aerosols. That's for sure, because actually because because of the decay of the aerosols, the aerosols tend to decay. So uh, I can imagine that at some point you will have more density at the lower levels of, of the floor, close to the floor, while CO2 doesn't have this, uh, this behavior. So this is an ongoing, uh, this is really an, an ongoing uh, experiment that we have been performing now from this Mesura uh, group. And from the scientific point of view, you are right, okay? Uh, the thing is that what we want to do is just uh, easy ways, general uh, ways for people to at least uh, control a little bit the amount of ventilation that, that, that we have. So even if in a special place of the room that is not very well ventilated, they have a higher level than the real measurement that we have on a room, well, at least we have something, at least they will take some actions to lower uh, the concentration of CO2 in this room, at least where the meter is measuring, which is already something, okay? But yeah, you have the, the right point on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Albert. Now, Jordi Faraudo, you are the next. You can talk now. The micro, eh? Check if the micro is on. It's open. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. perfect. Okay, great. Uh, sorry. And uh, first of all, th thank you, Albert, for this uh, very nice talk and very clear. And um, I wanted to make you two questions. One is that at the beginning, you mentioned the different uh, possible transmission paths mm -hmm. as a very, let's say, clear or separate uh, paths, uh, the one mediated by contaminated surfaces and the one mediated by aerosols. But um, I'm wondering to what extent we can, I mean, in some situations, it's clear the difference, but in some situations, it's not so clear the differences with the different transmission paths. I'm wondering whether you have considered this in the discussions in, in the group. I'm thinking about, for example, in, in experiments that people did uh, in the past with other uh, respiratory viruses like influenza viruses and cold viruses, in which they do things like um, looking at a contaminated blanket uh, from a person that has been in a room in which, I mean, he had a cold, for example, and or influenza, and, and he left a contaminated blanket in a room and then someone shake it the blanket and then you can detect aerosols um, with the virus floating in the room. So you can make aerosols from something that is contaminated the surface or a textile. You're right. You're so right. It's possible to re-aerosolize or I don't know how to say it yeah. correctly. You and... have the point here as well. Uh, I, I will answer this one first if you want. So. Uh, it's true. There are, th th this is a thing that uh, some some groups are trying to elucidate. Not not in our group, but some research groups on aerosols. <laughs> is that some aerosols that are on the floor and that the, the virus is not yet deactivated can go back to the air just through walking, for example, or as you said, to just moving a blanket. Okay, so you you are right on that. People are trying to calculate that. Anyway, it seems that is. Uh, 
it's a minor contribution. I have to say for, for what is, has been said in this group, I'm not an expert on that, is that while influenza is highly transmitted through surfaces, that's true, that doesn't happen on, on COVID, okay? I don't know why, I have no, no clue on that, but it's true that influenza is known that it's easily transmitted through surfaces. Okay, great. And, and my second question was about um, the effect of humidity. You, you mentioned several times that uh, relative humidity was an important factor, mm -hmm. and now summer is coming in which we have a lot of humidity in the ambient. Uh, so can you comment a little bit more about the effect of uh, relative humidity and the things well, that you Relative humidity that? has two effects. One effect, which uh, it's far from my field, which, which our, uh, our breathing system, our mucose, it's badly affected by low humidity. Okay, so it makes us less protective against any kind of virus. This is a thing, low humidity is bad for us, for as a human beings. Apart from that, uh, humidity, uh, High humidity induces more larger water droplets or larger aerosols. The larger the aerosols, the, the less time stay in, in the air. So this is a, the, the direct relationship, okay? The larger you have the, the, the droplets, the less time they, they float in air, okay? And according to summer, as I don't know if you, 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 you saw it, outdoors, there is no problem because UV light, it's killing everything really fast, okay? So in summer, outdoors, I think we are wonderfully safe. I, I'm not saying it's not possible to get uh, COVID, eh? but uh, indoors, if you have air conditioning with lower humidity, well, well, maybe it can uh, improve a little bit the risk of transmission. But as you, I don't know if you remember my graph, but it was an impact at 20%, but at 40% humidity, you are already in a, in a nice way. So it's only only important for the very low uh, humidity level. I have to say anyway that uh, no government has uh, already uh, put that as, as a rule, okay? So there are some controversy on that. It seems clear that from 40 to 60% humidity, we don't recommend more than 60% humidity for other reasons that is not related to COVID because high humidity is also bad for us. Okay, 40 to 60% humidity, it's a nice range in which we can be most safe regarding to humidity. Okay, so, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The next question is from the chat. Luis Rafael Lopez de Leon is asking, have you also measured other indoor air spaces such as underground transportation units or other spaces that are not so well ventilated and are harder to ventilate with outdoor air? Yes, there have been some uh, measurements on trains, buses in different cities of Spain. I have to say that the results belong to each of the uh, transport authorities in these cities and they are not public. Uh, so far, so I cannot show, show you them the results, uh, but we have we have performed it. Okay, uh, as a general rule, well, you can imagine that uh, ventilation in a metro it's more difficult than ventilation in a bus. That's that's for sure. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, as far as I know, good ventilation can be achieved if you take the, the appropriate measurements, which is not um, uh, changing, um, not putting more band, more fans or whatever. Uh, can be uh, achieved in any public transportation. Okay, thank you. So maybe there are questions here from people in the room. No? Okay, then we close the session. So thank you very much, Albert. It was very interesting. Thank you to all of you for yes. coming or listening me through your, yes. your labs. Okay, then we close the session. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you.